Hey, hey, it's Dr. Bitch. Just want to pick up where we left off on Hallucinogens Lecture 2 here. The important thing I want to do is walk through the individual hallucinogens, make sure we get a chance to review, and have a couple of sample questions. We're still in the serotonergic woods, and we're talking about psilocybin, the hallucinogen present in uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms. I did want to uh, allude to some clinical applications of these. Now, obviously, I'm Again, not recommending the whole game, but wanted to talk about some of the uh, applications that are in use. So uh, a couple of researchers have shown with randomized clinical trials that psilocybin can be beneficial for cluster headache. Cluster headache is a super hard to treat, real drag of serious, extreme, painful, debilitating headaches. And I'll actually put a link up for... Uh, a uh, seed from a documentary for a guy who actually owns a liquor store and like really doesn't like recreational drug use, but glows, grows his own mushrooms and does them about once a month, I think, to just make sure he doesn't uh, end up getting these cluster headaches. And it's a curious uh, impact of psilocybin and it's uh, been proposed in clinical trials and I believe there are some data on that. The cancer-related distress, so... Uh, my friend Charlie Grobe out in Los Angeles and uh, Roland Griffiths have done uh, small clinical trials where basically people have discovered that they've been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh, they were permitted to participate in these psilocybin sessions. It's not that you just come in and trip. You have you know support and you have a preparatory session and it's sort of a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for this distress. And so far the follow-up data look pretty promising. The depression trials, oh man, pharmacological treatment of depression is not an easy feat, but the psilocybin administration has been uh, multiple sessions. So again, you have that psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. You've got a lot of support. You're in a safe environment. You've been medically screened. You uh, go in with sort of an intention. There's soft uh, selected music. The environments are very comfortable. You've got a uh, eye shade on. So uh, basically, the five-week follow-up data suggests that folks who experience the most mystical experiences in response are the ones who seem to benefit the most. It's an intriguing uh, opportunity, and we you know, do see the serotonin system involved in some of our uh, antidepressants that folks take every day. I'm uh, eager to see what the one-year follow-up data look like. And finally, cigarette smoking, although the sample is small, there's... Uh, a clinical trial for psilocybin for cigarette smoking and a whole bunch of folks who've reported basically having a hallucinogen experience and then deciding to improve health behaviors more broadly in my lab. We have some ayahuasca data along these lines, uh, but the small sample, at least the folks who had the most mystical experience, who had sort of a breakthrough mystical experience, like I, 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 uh, I was really at one with the universe. I had no sense of self. Uh, those kinds of things, those were the folks who were more likely to quit smoking at follow-up. Okay, so here's a nice item, uh, just a question. Which of these is an acute effect of LSD? We have pinpoint pupils, decreased blood pressure, or intermingling of the senses. And of course, you know, it's C. Pinpoint pupils is actually the opposite of an LSD effect, as is decreased blood pressure. LSD tends to increase arousal, so we would have pupils that are big and open and dilated. Uh, blood pressure tends to go up, and the intermingling of the senses we've talked about before, that is a I hear music, I mean, I see music <laughs> response uh, common to a number of the serotonergic hallucinogens. Okay, a formal term for the intermingling of the census is synesthesia, tachycardia, or analgesia. And of course, you know it's synesthesia. And here's an, an opportunity to just do a little training on taking multiple choice exams. Obviously, if you know what tachycardia and analgesia are, you could figure this out just by process of elimination. And I encourage you to, you know, before you have a panic attack or talk yourself into a wrong answer, definitely try to do the process of elimination. Ideally, uh, take a look at the stem, right, the beginning part of the question first without looking at the options so you don't talk yourself into a wrong answer and then see if the thing you thought of is there. By all means, if that's the case, then pick it. Uh, finally, a microgram, is it one ten thousandth of a gram? 
one one hundred thousandth of a gram or one one millionth of a gram. And of course you do know that is C, one one millionth of a gram. I, I noted that some folks didn't know what the number one million looked like, so I thought I'd lay this out as well. All right. Well, let's pick it up with LAA, lysergic acid amide. This was often a precursor to LSD synthesis. Oh, man, I went too far. Well, let me give you the lowdown on LAA. The bottom line is that is the one that's present in morning glory seeds. All right, and again, you don't want to just purchase morning glory seeds and eat them. It's really hard to know what the dosage are. Many of the available seeds have toxins added to them to pre prevent abuse. They did have some religious uses in some cultures. Albert Hoffman, the guy who studied LSD, actually was the one who first identified LAA, lysergic acid amide. And it's similar to LSD, but nowhere near as potent. So some people say it's 1 13th as potent. I feel like those estimates are often kind of wacky. But in all honesty, LSD, because it's psychoactive in micrograms, is, you know, it's unparalleled. Of course, things aren't going to be as potent as that. Uh, and then, yeah, LAA is not a popular or common <laughs> drug of abuse. I'm not going to drive you nuts with that. So, dimethyltryptamine, DMT, my friend Rick Strassman calls it the spirit molecule. Let's take a look at some options on here. Well, it's from a bark resin, and in some nuts and seeds in the West Indies, Central and South America. Uh, it's strange, and it's not crystal clear why plants would have evolved to make this. And truth be told, it's not psychoactive uh, unless you have a monoamine oxidase inhibitor in your system, unless you decrease the activity of one of the enzymes that would break it down, no human, at least, is going to have a psychoactive experience just ingesting it on its own uh, orally. So it's inhaled. This is why, of course, DMT is smoked. Uh, the chemically synthesized woods are often just smoked through a pipe. It looks a little embarrassingly like crack. Uh, in the 1960s, this was called the businessman's LSD. I, uh, I've heard people say it's the it's the lunch hallucinogen, right? So actually, all the way into modern day, in part, it's just because it's got a short duration. So it certainly peaks at uh, 10 to 15 minutes. You do note physiological changes within 10 seconds. If you are going to have one of those breakthrough experiences like we talked about in psilocybin, the dose has to be pretty dramatic and pretty high. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, peaks at 10 to 15 minutes. So this is the, the hallmark of it, shall we say. Over uh, paranoia, anxiety, and panic are, are remarkably common. If you're not in a good headspace on this one, it can be really disorienting, and truth be told, if you do have that breakthrough experience, it's like there is no sense of self, there is no connection. Some folks find that really hilarious and feel very connected to the universe. Other folks find that super disturbing and upsetting and a uh, panic-inducing thing. Over in about an hour, I would say even at the highest doses, uh, after 45 minutes, although... Uh, folks are usually tired. They're really not having any kind of hallucinogenic experience so much as contemplating this notion that either, you know, their brain is capable of creating this effect where they feel connected to the universe or really upset and worried that they have lost uh, their sense of self and what that means to them. So the reactions uh, very much part of set and setting and also sort of where folks are in their lives and how personally connected they are to their uh, need to have an identity as an individual. Well, I'm going to add uh, right next to this harbine. A harbine is in the bark of the banisteriopsis vines. Right? And it's curious because this seems to have those MAOI uh, effects I was talking about with DMT. It tends to inhibit the monoamine oxidase, right? The enzyme that breaks down monoamines. And 
I don't need to drive your nuts with that, but that's why ayahuasca is basically a combination of plants, one with this harbide and one with uh, the DMT itself. So these are available in the Amazon region of South America. Primarily, uh, it's strange because it's not that one plant contains both things. You have to mix two plants together. When I asked the shamans, how did you guys know? I mean, there are literally 30,000 different plants in the Amazon. And they said, oh, the, the tobacco told us. So now we know how. Uh, bottom line is the drink ayahuasca is a combination of uh, anisteriopsis vines and uh, another plant. Basically, the ayahuasca uh, is created. Local shamans cook these together. You have to sing to it, apparently. Uh, kind of press them hard, you know, hammer on them in the water, boil them for a while, and then you create this combination. Chemically similar to serotonin, this is one where the, the shape of the molecule actually kind of makes some sense. And it's certainly a serotonergic hallucinogen and seems to have comparable effects to LSD, but nowhere near the duration because it's DMT-based. Uh, even ayahuasca does not seem to last, you know, that egregious 12 and 14 hour type trips unless you repeat the dosage. So yes, there's a trance or dreamlike state. People do report the same mystical experiences. This one tends to have uh, reports of hallucinatory images and animals. So I think in part because it's South America, you see you hear a lot about leopards and things like that. And then the Peruvian traditions and the Brazilian traditions are a little bit different. Uh, the Santo Daime Church, everybody does it in the daytime, everybody's dressed in white, everybody sings, everybody dances around, and it's very community-focused. In the Peruvian ones, uh, you only do it at night, they don't like to do it outside the way the Brazilians do, and there's a lot of... Uh, it's hard to explain, like demon folklore and a lot of spirit sort of polytheistic uh, approaches to it all. Santo Daime, in part because uh, it's syncretic, it's a combination of Christianity and some of the African religions. So they, you know, they literally pray to Jesus and stuff like that. Uh, but they also celebrate uh, Ogum. Uh, they celebrate some of these African uh, contributors, tricksters, deities. And so it's a, an intriguing approach. And it's interesting, they don't seem to uh, have the same harsh, you know, recovery time, but I think it's just because they do it in the daytime. They don't stay up all night doing it. So mescaline, you may have heard of, but it's basically uh, present in the peyote plant. Peyote is that uh, spineless cactus takes about three years to grow out in the desert. The San Pedro cactus also contains peyote, and I believe that one is still legal to grow, but not legal to harvest, which was a curious decision. And you see a lot of the southwestern United States uh, to northern South America, uh, of course, with global warming, this is probably going to change, but it really needs a lot of heat in uh, a dry environment. Uh, I have no idea how to make any suggestions about dosage for the plant itself or mescaline. It's in the Libriums. Peaks at 30 minutes to two hours. Doesn't seem to have that intense duration that LSD has, but, you know, markedly longer than DMT. The Native American religious worship, uh, my friend Cristala, is really involved in this crew and She's Native American. You have to be a member of the Native American church to uh, participate, but they, you know, essentially ingest the peyote and you have to be in the teepee. It's part of a formalized ritual. I believe it's only done once a month. If this is your religion and I'm messing it up, I, I apologize. Uh, bitter taste causes vomiting and headaches, distressing levels of nausea. This one really does make you throw up a lot. Uh, I mean, ayahuasca does that as well. But, you know, we uh, have framed throwing up as this terrible, horrible thing. They frame it as sort of getting rid of bad stuff. So they think of it as a purge, like 
the bad things in my life or the evil spirits or the toxins in my body are being removed. And so in some ways, uh, they can frame this as a, as a positive thing. In my lab, we talked to the ayahuasca folks and, and formed a, uh, a questionnaire to design, uh, basically assess, is ayahuasca the, the substance for you in a sense? And these tend to correlate negatively with intentions to use those. So even though people kind of frame it as, oh, I want to uh, make sure I clean myself out, this... Uh, extreme vomiting and headache and things like that, uh, they're less likely to want to repeat the experience. All right, I'm going to be blunt. Nobody does dumb. Let's just not even bother here. Uh, in part, it's just that the duration could be 25 hours. Nobody has time for that. It produces greater panic attacks. Need I say more? Like, it's just, it's not going to be a drug of abuse. You notice that it is related to methylamphetamine, but again, did, didn't catch on for pretty obvious reasons related to its subjective effects. In contrast, MDMA ecstasy is, uh, I mean, used by, you know, less than 4% of high school seniors, certainly, but uh, there was a time when it was uh, over 10%. So first appeared in the 1980s, and it was legal. Literally, you could purchase it in some bars in Texas and things like that. And it's rather unfortunate because mixing it with alcohol is really ill-advised, and it does essentially impair your ability to detect your own alcohol impairment. So it, it's, it's a rough combination. To never mix it, never worry. Some psychiatrists use it for therapy. That's what it said in the, in the book. I got a big kick out of that. We'll actually review. Uh, my friend Rick Doblin has run these PTSD trials. MDMA does seem to have uh, some pretty uh, intriguing therapeutic potential. The DEA still has it as Schedule 1. And by Schedule 1, I mean it is illegal to possess or sell because it's considered to have no medical use and a high addictive potential. Obviously, nobody's ever jonesing for MDMA, so I think the decision was a little bit weird. Uh, it was real big in rave culture in the 90s. Oh, uh, man, out in California, it seemed like it was everywhere in the late, early and late 90s. And then, yeah, ax, ecstasy. I can't keep track of all the slang, but I think Molly is probably the one that's most popular lately. So what are the effects? In part because it does have that amphetamine component, right? And now we're no longer in the dominant serotonergic, so much as the norepinephrine group. You do see short-term and long-term toxicity, although some of the first estimates uh, in the animal work got messed up and they gave this guy uh, basically another drug that was more toxic, thinking he was doing animal work with MDMA. But anytime you're going to raise the blood pressure that much and increase heart rate that much, it's just hard on your noggin. Severe hyperthermia, heat stroke. So I actually uh, had a student when I was still at Southern Cal who uh, basically ended up, you know, in an ambulance using MDMA uh, at a big rave like this. And that was the day he decided to convert and become a Muslim, which was intriguing. And he was actually a U.S. Army member at the time. Uh, I'm sure there are other stories of religious conversion. I just always found that one an intriguing one. So definitely elevated blood pressure and heart rate. And this is a lot like the stimulants we've talked about before. Long-term cognitive impairments. So, so this was, uh, I was really skeptical about this at first, but no, it really does document it. Folks tend to increase their dose and increase their frequency. So there were literally a time when, you know, the clubbing folks were doing four hits of ecstasy every weekend. This really does take its toll on frontal lobes in particular. And the frontal lobes are the part that helps you refuse that third beer or that second tab. So I really want to emphasize this. There are two studies suggesting that folks who use cannabis are uh, protected because of THC's basically neuroprotective effects, but again, I'm not recommending the home game, and it's just not a big enough effect to count on. 
definitely see reductions in impulse control and a decline in memory and attention. So if we were all in the same room, I would say we're going to all agree no one will get engaged to someone within three months of doing ecstasy with him or her, okay? We do see these prolactin, like oxytocin release, uh, strange social impact, the empathogen that I love everybody experience. That doesn't mean that that person is the person to marry. So don't make that decision during hallucinogen intoxication. And let's move on to a bit about those PTSD trials. So my friend Rick Doblin went through a ton of effort trying to get approval for this, getting the MDMA, uh, essentially ended up working in Israel with PTSD patients there. They've now run uh, a sample of 90. The PTSD group is definitely doing better than the control group. And the impact is a really rapid onset. The control group, at least in one study, used SSRIs, used these antidepressants, which are uh, often prescribed for PTSD. They take at least two weeks to kick in. The MDMA effects uh, were present on day two. And I got to admit that uh, a lot of other psychiatric meds have that kind of impact. Ayahuasca has been used for depression as well. And also has a really rapid onset. Um, data from my lab suggests that all of these probably work because it's not that you get this divine insight and now you're happy. It's that you start doing stuff that makes people happy. So in my lab, the ayahuasca led to uh, people starting to behave in ways that are consistent with their values, exercise more appropriately, eat better, get in touch with people they love, spend more time on recreational activities they enjoyed, not lie around in bed as much, and things like that. Ironically, this MDMA trial that uh, Rick Doblin uh, authored had fewer side effects than the SSRI. So the MDMA experience itself is certainly dramatic, but afterwards you don't get the dry mouth, sex dysfunction, nasty stuff associated with some of the antidepressants. And here's that reference. It just came out late last year, in case you want to look it up. Again, I'm not recommending the home game. This was supervised. Everybody was medically screened. It was uh, an intriguing way to go about uh, a randomized clinical trial. All right. Amanita muscaria. We're close to kicking it in, but I don't want to uh, wear out your memory. So let's go ahead and call this Hallucinogens 2, and I will kick it in on Hallucinogens 3. Thanks so much for coming along for the ride. You guys are doing great. I wish we were face-to-face, -face, but it seems like uh, you're, you're doing a good job. I really appreciate it.